From Covenant Presbyterian Church, this is Wednesday Night Live, our weekly Bible study through the book of James. Tonight, the finale of our study covering chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. Now, live in downtown Fort Smith, here's our teacher, Dr. John Clayton. Welcome again to Wednesday Night Live. I'm thankful that you have tuned in, and I'm thankful that we can gather together tonight and conclude our study of the book of James. Just a quick note on Wednesday Night Live. Our plan is, is to conclude for this semester, Wednesday Night Live, take a break through the summer months, and then start back, Lord willing, in the fall with a study of another New Testament book. And so we'll be getting more information out to you about that. Uh, but again, I'm thankful for your faithfulness. Thankful that you have studied through the book of James with us. And let's conclude our study tonight by looking at chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Beginning first with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have allowed us to study your word together through the means that you have provided we thank you for the way that you have sustained us, for the way that you have taught us, and we pray that you would continue to bless us in our study tonight as we study this concluding chapter and passage in your word in the book of James. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so again, as I say each week, uh, hopefully you've got your Bible there with you. Open up to chapter 5, and let's begin with verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. All right, so uh, tonight... What we're going to do uh, is look at this uh, general theme in verses 13 through 18, that prayer is a consistent and necessary grace of the church. Prayer is a consistent and necessary grace of the church. In our Reformed tradition, we refer to a prayer along with the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism, along with the reading and preaching of God's Word as the ordinary means of grace. And we'll certainly see James teaching us tonight about prayer and how it is a means of grace of God for His church. Let's begin with this first verse, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Now, as I understand it, the imperative to pray, the command to pray, is joined with the command to sing praise. The verb pray, the verb sing or sing praise are in the imperative. They are commands to us that we are to pray and to sing praise. But as I understand it, those are one and the same things because our prayers include praising God. That is a theme of prayer, that we are bringing praise to God 
And so also, we are praying for specific needs. In fact, in the Reformed tradition, the singing of psalms and the singing of hymns within congregational worship is actually understood to be prayer. And so when we gather on a Sunday morning and and we say, open up your hymnal to such and such page, and we sing that hymn together, uh, we understand that that is a form of prayer to God. Uh, So also the singing of psalms. In our church, we sing a psalm every Sunday, and we sing that psalm to God, but actually it is offered up to God as a form of sung prayer. And so as I understand it here, James is saying that we are to pray and we are to sing praise. And again, the context that James gives is whether there is need, as we're going to see here, sickness, or whether it is a cheerful singing of praise to God. I would, I would summarize, uh, if, if I was to pri- provide a translated paraphrase of this verse, I would paraphrase it this way. Suffering, pray. Cheerful, sing praises. Both are offered up to God. However, we need to make sure that we understand that the fundamental point that James is conveying here is that Prayer is essential. Prayer is essential. Prayer is not an afterthought. Prayer is not something that we simply do when we're stuck and there's no other hope and so we've got to pray to the man upstairs. Uh, no, that, that's not true. That's foolishness. Rather, prayer is an active part of the Christian's life because it is essential. And we should be careful not to interpret James' uh, command here to pray as a kind of passive resignation to a situation. As if to say, well, we've tried everything else, so we're going to pray about it. Even though that may be how some people act, that may be how some people live, that should not be said of us. It's not a passive resignation, but we are to take all things to the Lord in prayer. Well, James is going to get specific. Now, whether or not he is addressing a specific situation within the church a hypothetical situation in the church to teach something else or something in between. We don't know. Uh, But what we do know is he is going to address praying for someone who is sick. And so we could summarize it this way. That at the very least, we can understand that James is teaching that we are to pray for Sickness. Pray for sickness. I got a text even this morning uh, of a prayer request for a friend who is sick. Uh, And it's my privilege as a Christian to pray for that brother and to pray for his healing. Well, that is the case not merely for, not only for a pastor, but for all Christians and all of us within the church should pray for one another. And so James says, is anyone among you sick? The likelihood is yes. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now, closely tied in structure and theme, just as suffering calls for prayer, that's the last verse, are any of you suffering? Pray. Any of you cheerful? Sing praises. Any of you sick? Well, so also pray. It calls for prayer. Matthew Henry says, In the day of affliction, nothing is more seasonable than prayer. The spirit is then most humble, and the heart is broken and tender. It is necessary to exercise faith and 
and hope under afflictions and prayer is the appointed means for obtaining and ab- increasing those graces. Uh, that's encouraging words for us that prayer is fitting in the time of sickness. Now, although not specified, James is likely referring here to physical sickness, not spiritual sickness. Although we could certainly apply that, uh, but I believe in terms of the context here that James is talking about a physical sickness. Um, Alec Motor, a, a British scholar, argues that the context implies not only physical sickness, but a serious physical sickness. Um, he says that, number one, the elders are called to the sick person. Uh, that is, they're, they're too sick to even get out of bed, and so the elders are called to come to them. Number two, the elders do all the praying. Uh, the person's not praying with them, but the elders are called to pray for this person who is too sick to get out of bed. The person is called as we might think of it here, is is worn out or exhausted in verse 15. And then Motor says, number four, the faith is also that of the elders, not of the sick person. It is the elders who are to exercise their faith in praying to God that God might heal the person who is sick. And then fifthly, the elders pray over the person as if the one were confined to a prone position. Uh, and this is an, is an interesting case, and I, I agree with, with Motor in his argument here, is that even though in our evangelical language, uh, someone will say, we need to pray over this brother or sister in Christ, uh, a phrase that is more than likely been borrowed from James. In reality, the praying over in the context in which James is writing was literal. Uh, that's why I typically don't use that expression because my understanding is is this is literally you're praying over someone. They're laying in a bed and you are over them because they can't get out of bed. And so how else would you pray? You would pray over them because they are on their sick bed. Note that the one who the, those who are called are not just any church members. Uh, Those who are called are the presbyters, or as it's translated here in the ESV, the elders. The Greek word presbyteros, the elders of the local church. Uh, uh, A local pastor is not called, a, a priest is not called. No, it's the presbyters or the elders of that local church. And so every New Testament local church would have its own self-government, its own elders who are involved in the church government of that church, and they're the ones, the leaders of the church, the shepherds or under-shepherds, we would say, of the church are called to pray over the sick bed of this sick person. And they are also to do something else. They're to pray over this sick person. They are also to, quote, anoint the sick person with Oil. Now, there are a variety of interpretations of this expression, and I'm not going to go into all of them tonight, but to, to summarize it into two different arguments, there are those who understand the anointing with oil as a figurative expression, uh, and there is a solid argument for that. The book of James uses metaphorical, uh, allegorical, figurative language throughout the book, and so he could certainly be doing that here as he has done in other places within the book that we've studied. Uh, the other interpretation is that this is a literal translation, uh, that those who have come are literally anointing the person with oil. Uh, We don't know where the oil is applied on the sick person, which has led some who take that literal approach of interpretation uh, to believe that this could be some kind of reference to medicinal use. Uh, For example, there's a similarity in the parable of the Good Samaritan and the application of oil for medicinal use on that specific location uh, that was injured 
that needed the application of that oil. Uh, others that take a literal approach would just simply think of the traditional approach of the anointing on someone's head, the forehead or the head with the application of that. Those that take a metaphorical approach uh, take this as a spiritual understanding of the anointing, of the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, through the prayers of the elders. Um, I am not going to argue with either side of that. Um, in, in my interpretation of it, I lean toward the figurative use of it. Uh, but if uh, we're called to in our church to anoint uh, physically with oil, I will certainly participate in that. Uh, I think that both are valid interpretations, and uh, we just don't have enough information here to take a hard stance on either one of those. And so I think either interpretation is right. Regardless of your position on that, the anoint with oil should be understood as subordinate to the prayer. As the main verb is translated, they, meaning the presbyters or elders, they should pray, followed by the participle anointing. They should pray anointing with oil. Furthermore, any applica applicating power attributed to the oil should be denounced. Uh, it, it's not magic oil. Uh, it's not, it, it is, I like to say, some kind of woofle dust uh, that has magical powers. Um, there is no, nothing in the context of James writing that would lead us to believe that somehow that oil needs to be applied as if a magic potion on different parts of the body, uh, but rather uh, there is a purpose to be submitted or subordinate to the prayers of the elders and who are praying in the name of the Lord and praying through faith. The emphasis here is not the oil. The emphasis here is on the Lord. They are praying in the name of the Lord through faith that He will do as He purposes to do. Prayers in faith may result in healing. Uh, one commentator says that the prayer of faith is difficult to define, but may safely be deduced to mean knowledge of God's will for a particular situation when no scriptural guidance is available. Um, we could uh, expand on that to say that, that it is the, the elders who know this sick person on their sick bed uh, well within the church will, will know how specifically to pray and they would know the specific situation. They would trust the Lord in faith. Uh, to guide and direct their prayers, so forth and so on. Such prayers then may result in healing, but James' teaching should not be interpreted as healing form as a, a as healing formula conditioned upon faith. And, and here's where we need to be careful, and I think this is an area where some in our age have gone astray in this, is they have taken this verse out of its context and they have created some kind of mathematical formula that goes a little something like this. Sick person prayers, sick person is healed if those who are praying had enough faith if the oil was applied the right way and the person who was prayed for had faith as well, etc., etc., etc. And if that person is not healed, well then there was a problem. There was a problem with the faith of those who were praying. There was a problem with the application of the oil. There was a problem with the faith of the one to be healed. And so it's their fault the person wasn't healed. Well, that's just simply not supportable in Scripture. Uh, the, what James is teaching here is not some kind of formula that is to be applied, but rather they are trusting in the Lord and they're trusting in faith. 
uh, we should understand this through the lens of chapter 1. And we can't take this last part of chapter 5 and say, well, now this means something different than what James has taught throughout the rest of the book. I mean, for example, hold your place in chapter 5. I want you to turn back to chapter 1 in our very first study when we looked at this. And I want to remind you of this. Starting in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask God who gives generously to all without approach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so, certainly, we need to pray in faith, not doubting. But look at the preceding passage. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God is at work in sickness. God is at work in our suffering. Or think about it this way in the testimony of the Apostle Paul who said three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. That is uh, what we will interpret it as uh, some kind of sickness, a thorn in the flesh as he defines it, something in his life uh, that he had prayed that the Lord would deliver him from. And he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that, I sh- that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. There was no problem with Paul's prayers. It wasn't that the oil wasn't applied rightly, if even that's what that means. No. The point is, is that God does as He pleases for His glory and our good. And in the case of Paul, God chose not to deliver him from his thorn in the flesh, but rather to reveal to him his dependence upon God growing him in Christ's likeness, which is so much better than being delivered from that thorn in the flesh. And so, we must see this teaching in the lens, in the greater context of the book of James, but so also in the greater context of what the Bible teaches. Which leads us then to verse 15 or rather the second half of verse 15, in which we see that faith and obedience cannot be separated, notably in prayer. Look at the second half of verse 15. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. What's the summary of what James is teaching here? The summary is, well, it's really one of the summary points of the entire book, isn't it? Faith and obedience. Faith and obedience. Sickness could be attributable to sin in this person's life. But not always. Not always. James says, if he sins, we must be careful not to practice the bad theology of Job's friends. 
I, I find it hard to believe that some will say that someone is being punished and know for a fact that they are for sins, specific sins that they have committed. I wonder sometimes if they have failed to read the book of Job. Those were the accusations of Job's friends. And yet, God said that Job was innocent. Now, God revealed himself more clearly and showed himself in compassion and mercy to Job through the ordeal, the trials and tribulations of his life, but it wasn't because of Job's of a specific sin in Job's life, but rather God's greater purposes. Sickness, however, may rightly call us to examine our lives. Uh, sickness may wake us up. Uh, the Puritans taught that sickness is teaching. It's teaching us something. Examine our lives. Confess our sins and not harbor any unconfessed sin for which God may be rooting out through the means of this sickness. That's what James is describing here when he says if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. It's, it's in this process that God is revealing the utter dependence we have upon him. And note that the confession James describes here is an indirect reference to healthy church discipline. I mean, there is nothing private about this sickness. There's nothing private about the prayer. There's nothing private about confession and healing. Rather, all of this that we read here is done in the context of the local church. I might add that in an era in which many see no need for the local church or see no need for membership and faithfulness within the local church, we see very clearly here that the one who is sick must call on the elders of a local church church. And so in this we see the necessity of the local church. And God uses the local church and He uses sickness and He uses the prayers of the elders and uses the church in community together to work in our lives, to mature us, to conform us to the image of Christ in keeping with Romans chapter 8. But we also see that there is an importance to the one who prays, or specifically the one who prays in their relationship with God and rightly praying. Let's look at this in the second half of verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. What James is conveying here, if I could just summarize it in two words, is righteous prayer. This is not someone merely going through the motions. Rather, it is one who is a child of God by God's grace through faith. And so also one who is in right relationship and fellowship with God. It's not merely the power of prayer as the modern evangelical cliche is, but it is the prayer of a righteous person. However, Calvin cautions us here. And he says that not that our prayers are founded on our own worthiness, but because the heart must be cleansed by faith before we can present ourselves before God. And I think that is a good and healthy, and we would expect that from Calvin, to caution us about putting any kind of emphasis upon us. Or as I like to say, uh, there is no power in prayer. But there is power in God. 
to whom we pray. And so I don't believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of God who works through the ordinary means of grace of prayer. And the reason why I do that is in keeping what Calvin is teaching here is the point's not our worthiness. The point is, is the worthiness of God to whom we live in righteousness before. Or as I taught in our last study, to live quorum Deo, to live before the face of God. The participle that's translated in this verse is working. It may be an encouragement to the church. It may be an encouragement to you and to me of consistent prayer. Not a reference to the economy of an individual prayer. Or in the sense that God works through the means of the prayers of His people. Is God sovereign? Indeed, He is. Will God accomplish whatsoever He pleases? Indeed, He will. Does God ordain whatsoever comes to pass? Indeed, He does. Does God work through the means of the prayers of His people? Indeed, He does. In our finite minds, we want to pit the two against each other. But they should not be pitted against each other. One describes God's sovereignty. The other describes the means through which He accomplishes His sovereign purposes. And God accomplishes His sovereign purpose through the prayers of His people. And so, what's an example? It was an example of God accomplishing His purpose through the means of the prayers of His people. Insert exhibit A, Elijah. The example of Elijah emphasizes a humble trust in God's provision. Rather than a formulaic or arrogant demanding prayer. And Matthew Henry pushes back against this idea that we could somehow demand something of God, that we could somehow name it and claim it, that we could somehow take Bible verses, insert them as some sort of formulaic prayer that God must be respond to because we have manipulated in Him into in some kind of response. No. Matthew Henry says, In prayer, we must not look to the merit of man, but to the grace of God. It is not enough to say a prayer, but we must pray in prayer. Thoughts must be fixed. Desires must be firm and ardent. Graces exercised. This instance of the power of prayer encourages every Christian to be earnest in prayer. I think that's a good encouragement to all of us. James is teaching us to pray fervently to our God. The translation, in fact, that he prayed fervently is actually in a more wooden sense would be that he prayed prayer. And that's why Henry makes that comment, by the way, uh, in his commentary. Uh, but we translate it fervently because it's a Hebrew uh, expression that doesn't convey very well into Greek and then into English. Uh, but the idea is of intense, devoted, devout, dedicated prayer to God. The biblical account of Elijah's Prayers also include an understanding that he was praying according to God's will. He was the prophet of God. God had called him, God had given him his word, and God had instructed him how to pray. Elijah was not praying solo. It wasn't all his idea, but rather he was praying according to God's will. Well, that's verses 13 through 18. And now what I want us to do is I want us to look at these two remaining verses because there's a lot packed in these last verses. And what I want us to look at is that the Christian life is active. Now we just saw in the example of Elijah that uh, prayer... The means of, or rather we um, accomplish God's purpose 
He accomplishes His purpose through the means of our prayers. And those prayers are not merely passive, but we are engaged and we are praying fervently, so to speak. But so also, our Christian life is to be lived out like that. Our prayers and everything else is active. Let's look at verse 19. My brothers... If any one among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, pause there for just a second, because we're going to look at the second half of that. But starting here in verse 19, what we're going to see here is that fellow church members may stray from the truth, which requires action or There is to be, in the church, active engagement. We're not going to see in the Scriptures passive pew-sitting or simply attending on Sunday morning to get the church fix. No, the church is a family. The church lives in community together and it is active participation among its members. And James gives the example of one who is straying from the truth. Straying from the truth, let me be clear, is not a certainty, but is a possibility. In other words, not every Christian strays from the truth, but there are some who could. Uh, likely, you looking at other passages of Scripture, and I'm thinking about specifically 1 John, or I'm thinking about uh, 1 and 2 Peter, it could be because of deception. Uh, Someone may have been led astray by false teachers, uh, led astray by some kind of deception, perhaps the worldly wealth that we've looked at uh, in this text. But whatever the case is, they've been led astray. Whether wandering refers to outright apostasy is unclear here. But Calvin concludes in his interpretation that this is one who is in need of salvation. And I want to read the quote from Calvin in which he makes this argument. Uh, Calvin says, To give food to the hungry and drink to the thirsty, we see how much Christ values such acts. But the salvation of the soul is esteemed by him much more precious than the life of the body. We must therefore take heed lest soul perish through our sloth, whose salvation God puts in a manner in our hands. Not that we can bestow salvation on them, but that God by our ministry delivers and saves those who seem otherwise to be nigh destruction. Now whether or not this is one who is unregenerate, Uh, or not, uh, I'm not convinced either way. Uh, But what we do know, it is is someone who is straying from the fold. And this requires our active engagement. The truth here, as James describes, it could refer to doctrine. But given James' emphasis on the practical, it's more than likely referring to behavior. They are one who is strayed from the Christian ethic conveyed in their life, witnessed in their life. Well, what do we do? Well, let's look at this last verse together. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and recover a multitude of sins. And I want to summarize this last verse this way. Love for one another is demonstrated in actively seeking reconciliation. We are, as the Apostle John teaches us in 1 John, we are to love one another. And in the most dramatic sense, it can be seen in going after one who has strayed from the fold.
based on verse 19, it appears that the wanderer is the one who is saved and forgiven. Uh, I don't interpret this verse as somehow uh, the, the Christian church member who goes after the one wandering, brings them back into the fold, and then somehow uh, they are saved uh, or, or given some kind of, of salvation. Um, I don't understand it that way. Uh, what I understand translating it is, is that the one who is rescued is saved. Does that mean saved in the sense of they are regenerated, they're justified, adopted, uh, sanctified, or does that just simply mean that they have been saved away from the snares, debauchery, the evils of the world? Is it in a figurative sense? Uh, well, I don't know. It could be both. And that's how I would understand it since it's not clear here within the text. The implication, however, the bigger teaching of what James is conveying here is that love is expressed practically in this saving or rescuing act and possibly draws from Proverbs chapter 10 verse 2 which says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. And it may be what James is drawing from here in his quoting of a multitude of sins. Whatever the case, the point is, is that we are to love one another in the church. That is an active participation within the church and that brings us to a conclusion of the book of James. I hope that this has been a rewarding study for you. I hope that you have studied this book like you have never studied it before. And I hope that God has opened your eyes to see new things within this book that has matured you and grown you in your faith, has encouraged you as a Christian, but most importantly has, been, has given glory to God in His revelation. Well, whatever the case may be, I pray that God blesses you in your continued study of His Word and blesses all of us, His people, as we are faithful to study His Word together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your special revelation to us. We thank You for this specific book and the wisdom that we have gleaned from it. And we thank You that we have been able to study this together uh, through the means that You have provided. And we pray that You would help us to be faithful to what You have taught us. We pray that you would help us to not merely be hearers, but doers of your word. We pray that you would help us to remember and to even have our memories recall what we have read and what we have studied. We pray that your Holy Spirit would apply your word to our lives, that you would encourage us and edify us. And we pray above all that you would be glorified that Christ would be exalted through our study of your word. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.